We come now to John 5. After these things was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem at the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a multitude of sick, blind, lame, withered, awaiting the moving of the water, for an angel descended at a certain season in the pool and troubled the water. Whoever therefore first went in the water, <coughs> after the troubling of the water, became well, whatever disease he labored under. But there was a certain man there who had been suffering under his infirmity thirty and eight years. Jesus, seeing this man lying there and knowing that he was in that state, now a great length of time, says to him, Wouldest thou become well? The infirm man answered him, Sir, I have not a man in order, when the water has been troubled, to cast me into the pool. But while I am coming, another descends before me. Jesus says to him, Arise, take up thy couch, and walk. And immediately the man became well, and took up his couch, and walked. And on that day was Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to the healed man, It is Sabbath, it is not permitted thee to take up thy couch. He answered them, He that made me well, he said to me, Take up thy couch and walk. They asked him therefore, Who is the man who said to thee, Take up thy couch and walk? But he that had been healed knew not who it was, for Jesus had slidden away, there being a crowd in the place. After these things Jesus finds him in the temple and said to him, Behold, Thou art become well, sin no more, that something worse do not happen to thee. The man who went away, the man then went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And for this the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father works hitherto, and I work. For this, therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only violated the Sabbath, but also said that God was his own father, making himself equal with God. We will stop the reading here and then continue later. I would like to try to take this chapter in its entirety, because it is helpful to see the connection between these uh, four different parts of the chapter the physical healing, the spiritual healing, then the greatness of the person of the Lord in his ministry, and then the four witnesses. The chapters that went before we have seen in John 1, the introduction to this whole gospel, and then <coughs> chapter 2, 3 and 4, um, introduced the beginning of the miracles of the Lord. He had seven miracles or signs written in John's gospel um, until... He died, and these signs have been written to show us who He is how, who, and His greatness. And the first two were in chapter 2 and 4. We have seen there for uh, how He brought in life there where death reigned. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 in a different way in connection with Nicodemus. In chapter 4 with the healing of the nobleman's son. And in chapter 5, there is a different emphasis. There also is a condition of death and a gracious intervention of the Lord in His tremendous power, as we hope to see in this chapter. And then this will follow, uh, be followed up in chapter 6 and 7. Uh, each chapter with a different emphasis. We see in John's Gospel that often an event is at the beginning of the chapter and then this introduces a discourse that the Lord gave in connection with the event that happened. And so this is very helpful to see the structure of John's Gospel and to see how the greatness of the Lord Jesus is shown in different ways. And then from chapter 8 to 12 we'll see the emphasis is on light. And in chapter 13 to um, 17 the emphasis is on love. And then, of course, the climax, in a sense, of the whole gospel is then the sufferings, the death, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Wonderful gospel it is. 
written in very simple language in the Greek especially one can see that compared with Luke's writings it is such a simple language and yet a depth is presented in this gospel a depth that can nowhere else be found so may the Lord bless these moments as we consider this wonderful chapter and so what we have here is a wonderful summary of the life giving power that the Lord Jesus has as the son of God and as the son of man he stepped into death so that we would receive life and then in the day that we live through the power of the Holy Spirit he communicates this life as we hope to see in chapter 7 now the first part of this chapter I just want to just give you a brief outline this chapter first presents this physical healing of this man who had no one to help him he was in a desperate situation then this is taken by the Lord to provide an object lesson of spiritual healing not only this man needed spiritual healing the whole nation needed a spiritual healing then the third step is that the Lord shows his greatness that he is co-equal with the Father the Son and the Father are co-equal and so he defends his ministry and then at the end of the chapter we find four witnesses the Lord himself is the faithful witness as we know from Revelation but besides him there are four witnesses that confirm his ministry and we'll see that at the end of the chapter so if the, if the Lord helps us this morning in this sense I would just like to give a brief overview of the whole chapter and then perhaps another time we can go back into certain details and what we also see in John's Gospel this chapter starts with a, an event, a historic event this healing of this man and then that introduces uh, further uh, spiritual teaching that the Lord gives here in chapter 5 the same in chapter 6 and in other chapters we see the same pattern so here is now the feast of the Jews probably there are if this is the Passover we are not 100% we sure about that but that's probably the case then there are four Passovers mentioned in John's Gospel and that uh, establishes then that the ministry of the Lord was a, a bit more than three years then we have seen that he started in Judea and then later on he goes to Galilee but now he's back uh, in Jerusalem again because according to the law the Jews had to go up three times in a year to Jerusalem notice from Deuteronomy 12, Deuteronomy 16 and other uh, scriptures but notice here that this feast if you make a note, Leviticus 23 summarizes the seven feasts of the Lord, gives details, other scriptures also. But now, this feast had become a feast of the Jews. Why is this written this way? Of course it was the feast of the Lord. But you know, the religious leaders used this occasion to establish their authority and to make it something for their own glory. And that is why it was a feast of the Jews. In chapter 2 we saw the uh, purification rites of the Jew. In chapter 3 we saw a ruler of the Jews. Here we have a feast of the Jews. That is not uh, anti-Semitism. It is just to show that the ru rulers had uh, made the things of God things for their own glory. And they controlled these things for their own uh, authority and position. And that is why the Lord Jesus is going to um, provoke them in a sense. Not in a carnal sense, of course. The Lord never acted in a carnal way. But he put them to the test through this miracle which was done on Sabbath day. And it was a purpose that the Lord had. He wanted to confront those leaders, as we see in this chapter. And so you can study that many references uh, to the Jews in this gospel that emphasize how they had built their own religious system but not according to God's thoughts and that can happen also to us that's an application of course that we can make we can use the things of God to build something for ourselves for our own glory now then we see the misery of the people under that system in verse 2 and following there was at the sheep gate 
Now you know the sheep gate uh, is really uh, connected with the people. God had his people as a flock of sheep. And so everyone would enter through the sheep gate and belong to the people of God and to the city of God. You can see that in the book of Nehemiah chapter 3. And so that is um, a reference to the people seen as a flock. And then there was a provision uh, made there, a pool, and that's called Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy. Hesed, uh, that is compassion, and that is the house of compassion that we have here. It had five porches. Now, I don't want to uh, let, let our fantasy go, but some have compared the five porches with the five continents. I don't know. But if you see the whole five continents, continents of this earth, there are more than five, but where people live, then you see their condition is really presented here in these verses. Sick, and that is also the word for weakness, blind, lame, so they couldn't walk, withered, all kind of handicaps. That is the physical condition of people. But this physical condition represents also their spiritual condition. So what we are going to see in this chapter, this man represents this nation. He represents those leaders. They didn't realize it, but those leaders were in that condition. They tried to please God, but they were not able to. They had to learn that. Something similar you see in Acts, in chapter 3, when God offers a new offer of grace to the Jewish nation. The Lord from heaven sends his disciple, uh, his apostle Peter, presenting to them a new message of grace. It again is rejected, but my point is, it is seen in this man in Acts 3 who was paralyzed. And the Lord and Peter healed him through the power that came from the Lord from above. But this man put his trust in the message that Peter brought. And so what we see also in this chapter here, this man put his trust in the Lord when the Lord said to him, Rise. We'll see that in a moment. Now there were some provisions that the Lord made for the time being. The angel touched the water and then someone who would come down was healed instantly. That was God's mercy that goes together with Bethesda. But that was very limited. You see now in the person of the Lord all the resources were there to bring help in this tremendous need. And sad to say this resource was rejected by the leaders. Uh, although they had the clear evidence because that is what we find in this chapter also the Lord showed by doing this miracle who he really was that he was himself Jehovah who heals the people Psalm 103 he was the one who came according to the prophets uh, Isaiah 35 I read a few verses in the millennium that will happen again in Isaiah 35 5 then the eyes of the blind shall be opened we'll see that later in John 9 the ears of the deaf be unstopped that happened also during the ministry of the Lord Jesus then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb sing for in the wilderness shall waters break out see all the resources to do these miracles they were there and the Lord did those miracles he healed the leper he healed the blind he healed the dumb uh, and so on and so they knew from these Old Testament scriptures and other scriptures the Lord Jesus was there and he is Jehovah he is the Messiah and this is the point of John's gospel John's gospel was written at the end chapter 20 verse 31 these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ God's anointed one the son of God and that believing you may have life through his name this is the purpose of this gospel and so his greatness is presented as the great healer the son of God but then he was rejected now with this power that the Lord Jesus has he comes to this man. In verse 5 we see there was a certain man there who had been suffering under his infirmity. Infirmity, weakness is the same. He was uh, unable to do anything to uh, bring in a remedy in this miserable condition. And that was for 38 years. Now perhaps you remember that uh, in the history of Israel there was a 38 year period after the law was given until they entered the um, plains of Moab 
Moses refers to that in Deuteronomy 2. You can check it. There we have the number of 38 years. They had been in the wilderness for 38 years, years under the law. They were just like this man, helpless, hopeless in themselves. And they all died. This whole generation died. Every day about 100 people died. It's, that was the condition. And so here it's still the same condition that we see here. That's a parallel with Israel in the wilderness. There is no remedy. They are totally weak. They cannot serve God in their own strength, even if they would want to. Now make the parallel with us. Who were we? We were not able to bring glory to God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 5 it says we were weak, without strength, just like this. And in my own condition, before I got saved, I was just like this man. Uh, and if you try to bring in a remedy in your own strength, it won't work. The 38 years show that definitely a person under the law cannot improve himself if you try. But even without the law, we're weak. you cannot improve your own condition. This is illustrated here in this man. Helpless and hopeless. He says, I have no man. So... When the Lord comes there in His grace, He will bring in the remedy. Where we were totally in misery. Romans 7 shows that. Miserable man. Who can help me? Well, there is the helper. Here comes. Jesus seeing this man lying there and knowing that he was in that state, great length of time now, says to him, Wouldest thou become well? Well, obviously. And so the unfair man answered him, Sir, I have not a man in order when the water has been stirred to cast me into the pool. He was still relying on that provision, but there was no man to help him. So he was helpless and hopeless. And then, you see, the Lord speaks to him. This powerful word, arise. The same like Peter said on, in Acts 3. And so this man accepted that word. He obeyed. The Lord said, Arise, take up thy couch, and walk. Three things, three commands. And so there was a response. The man obeyed. The people in general, the leaders, did not want to put their trust in the Lord. They did not want to obey. But here he did. And what notice in verse 9? Immediately. It was not a long process needed or uh, trying to improve. That long process was behind him now. It had not worked for 38 years and it would never work. But what works is God's intervention. What works is what the Lord says. So he rose up, he took his couch and he walked. And that exactly was forbidden by the law. Not by the law of Moses. It was forbidden by the reinterpretation of the leaders, how they interpreted the law of Moses. They had 1,500 commands just about the Sabbath day. So according to their rules, he was not supposed to carry something on Sabbath. It was not forbidden in the law of Moses. You had to keep the Sabbath, that was all, and honor God. It was not forbidden that a man would be healed on Sabbath. So... That is why we have seven healings on Sabbath in the Gospels. Because the Lord wanted to bring this point out very clearly. He was, not, um, he was following the Mosaic law. He was the only faithful Jew who ever kept the law of Moses 100%. But he did not follow their interpretation of the law. He didn't follow their man-made rules which were a heavy burden. This man had already a heavy burden anyway. And now they were still heaping more heavy burdens on the people. But they did not realize that this was their own condition. This man reflected the condition of the people under the law. This man reflects the condition of each person even believers who try to improve themselves. If you try to improve yourself, you're just like this man. You will not succeed. It, you need to cast yourself on the Lord. You need an intervention by the Lord. And of course here, all the initiative comes from the Lord. He's the, the one who starts this question, brings in this question. He does the action. He does everything. And so then this causes the reaction of the Jewish leadership. When this man was walking around there on the Sabbath with his couch, 
they said in verse 10, the Jews, that again the same expression, it is Sabbath, it is not allowed or permitted thee to take up thy couch. And then he answered, he that made me well, he said to me, take up thy couch and walk. So here we have a confrontation um, between what the Lord commanded and what the leaders said. And then in verse 12, they asked this question, and now notice, who is the man? This implies that they despised him. Who is the man who said to thee? They did not honor the Lord, didn't want to honor because he was in conflict with their rules and regulations and that is, they speak in, a dis, in despising terms and even today the Orthodox Jews would speak about that man, just not mention the name, but just that man to express their, uh, their despising their dis, how they despise him and then in verse 13, but he that had been healed knew not. So he had not a relationship yet with the Lord. That would come later. But he knew not who it was. Because the Lord had departed from there. He didn't want to um, make himself public. He didn't want to seek popularity there. That he, he had already shown earlier in chapter 2, the works. They saw the signs but they did not believe in him. They believed the signs, but that was about it. And we have seen in chapter 3 that Nicodemus had to go further than just seeing the signs. A work of God was needed, we saw in, in uh, Nicodemus. And so here also a work of God is needed in this man. And the Lord accomplished that work, which is therefore an illustration. The physical healing is an illustration of a spiritual healing that was needed. And that we see in verse 14, Behold, thou art become well, sin no more, that something worse do not happen to thee. So now the Lord is concerned about the spiritual well-being of this man, here in verse 14, when he meets him in the temple. And that was a good thing. This man wanted to bring thanks, give thanks to the Lord. He went to the temple. And there he met the Lord Jesus. And the Lord speaks these words. And these words show that that was another matter that needed to be settled his spiritual healing and then the man went to the Jews in his uh, uh, naivete perhaps and there he said who Jesus, that it was Jesus who had made him well and then the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him that is found many times and the Lord says later in, excuse me, in John 15 they have persecuted me they will persecute you that same mentality is there during the ministry of the apostles that same mentality is still there today that is the mentality of the religious people whether it is Jewish religious people or in other contexts people put themselves under a law this will cause uh, hatred towards the Lord Jesus that's the bottom line and so they persecuted the Lord Jesus sought to kill him because he had done these things on Sabbath so that is one reason they wanted to kill him because he did not uh, follow their interpretation of the Mosaic law but then there is a second reason why they wanted to kill him and that is in verse 17 Jesus answered them my father works hitherto and I work you're talking about Sabbath? Realize, how can we rest? Sabbath is rest. God rested after the creation in Genesis 1. But this rest was disturbed by the fall in Genesis 3. And God works hitherto. From Genesis 3 till the coming of the Lord Jesus, God was at work. That is what the Lord mentioned here. And then he says, and I work. So he sees himself the same level as the Father and that the Jews understood right away they say they therefore sought even the more to kill him because he had not only violated the Sabbath but also said that God was his own father so you see now they have a second reason to kill the Lord Jesus that shows their hatred and it shows also their total misunderstanding of who he was they understood one thing that you can, a man cannot make himself God they understood that perfectly but they did not realize or did not want to realize the Lord Jesus is God and so he is seen here one with the Father now perhaps another time we'll go into a few details but I want you to study this in the meantime 
There are ten proofs in this chapter about the unity between the Father and the Son. Here we have in verse 17 the unity in works. They work in unity. And then we see there is also an equality in verse 19. He did not make himself equal with God as they claimed. No, in verse 19 the Lord says, Verily, verily, that's always an important statement, only in John's Gospel. 25 times we have verily, verily. So, amen, amen. So, 50 times the word amen. And then, I say to you, he speaks with great authority. Also 25 times this is recorded in John's Gospel. I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, save whatever he sees the Father doing. So, here we see equality. This verse is often seen as a proof of inferiority. You have the Father and then you have the Son. That's a total misunderstanding of this verse. The Lord shows here He is equal with the Father. And that is why He cannot do anything on His own. Because they are always in harmony, in equality. It is not a matter of inferiority at all. And that is a very important statement. And of course they did not realize that. And then there is a third Unity, and that's the unity in love in verse 20. For the Father loves the Son. Now you have seven times in John's Gospel, often seven, uh, seven because that is a number of perfection and completeness. So seven times the Father loves the Son. But here is the one time that it is the filial love. The other six times it is agape love. But here it is the filial love. God, the Father, found something special in the Son that caused this filial, this comrade kind of love towards Him. That is, to emphasize the relationship, unity in love, and the appreciation that the Father had for the Son. So that's a wonderful verse that shows another aspect of this, um, this unity. And then when we come to verse... Uh, the end of verse 20 it says he will show him greater works than these that ye may wonder that we will see later in this gospel these greater works uh, the Lord is the one who brings eternal life and that is in chapter 6 so we see that later and then in verse 21 for even as the father raises the dead and quickens them does the son also quickens whom he will There is great emphasis in this book on quickening. Here the Father quickens and the Son quickens. In chapter 6 we will see the Son of Man quickens. In chapter 7, if I am not mistaken, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit also quickens. So this is the quickening power that the Lord Jesus has, that the Father has, that the Holy Spirit has, that the Son of Man has. So there is unity in quickening power. And then notice in verse 21, even as the Father raised the dead and quickens them, does the Son also quicken whom He will. There is unity in sovereignty. This is the sovereign will, the sovereign will of God. And so the Lord Jesus has this sovereignty. He is God, blessed over all. And so there we see this unity in another way. God wills, the Father wills, and so the Son, He wills. Now verse 22 and and verse 27 speak about judgment. Verse 22, Neither does the Father judge anyone, but has given all judgment to the Son. So here we see unity in judgment. Um, Of course the Father can judge, but He has delegated that to the Son. In verse 22. And as a result of that, in verse 23, all may honor the Son, that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. There is unity in honor. Both the Father and the Son receive honor, or must receive honor. And, of course, the Son of Man will also receive honor. But here it is in connection with the Father and the Son. Then in verse 24, we come to a very important verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that he that hears my word and believes him that has sent me has life eternal. So, there's two conditions. Hear and believe. And this is to all of us. Did you already hear? You have two ears to hear. But also you need to hear with your heart. 
and you put your trust in the Lord, then you believe. So you hear the message, you need to be saved. You hear it, and you believe it. This man hear, hear the Lord say, Rise! And he rose, he obeyed, he believed. And so that is faith that we all need. We need to put our trust in the Lord. And so this is wonderful. This is the day of grace in which we live. Yes, the day of judgment is coming for sure. But in the meantime, if you hear and believe, what happens? You are transferred from the domain of, of death and under judgment. You, you receive at the same time you believe eternal life. It's not saying that, this verse does not say, well, perhaps one day you know you receive eternal life if you are very courageous, if you are very faithful, if you do everything well, then maybe you'll receive eternal life. That's not what the Lord is saying here. The moment you hear and believe, you receive life eternal. And as a result of that, you do not come into judgment. So that is a wonderful promise. When the Lord says, this transfer that I referred to earlier is passed out of death into life. So this man was in a condition of death. He was just waiting to die physically, but morally he was dead. And we read in Ephesians 2 that we were all dead in sins and trespasses. We were morally dead for God. And so we need this quickening. We need this quickening done by the Father and by the Son. And then the moment we believe, that's our side. You see, just a little princess, how God's side, God's work, God's sovereign work goes together with our side. We need to hear, we need to believe, and then you receive eternal life. And the two go together. That we see many times. It is a mystery. And then the result is you've passed from one domain to the other domain. From death to life. This expression past is only used one more time in 1 John 3 verse 14. I'll just read it to you. It's a very interesting uh, parallel. In 1 John 3 verse 14 we read, Do not wonder, brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death to life. So the believer knows this. And John says it, we know. That is the privilege of the Christian um, the Christians, we know that we have passed from death to life. So that is the follow-up. In John we see how it happens. But in 1 John it is confirmed so that we know that indeed this is what happened. We know that we have passed from death to life. Because the moment we believed. But here it says, because we love the brethren. That shows another dimension. We belong to the same family. Wonderful. We go back to John 5. And then we see again a matter of this judgment, but now it's coming. Verse 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you that an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. That's today, the day of grace. As this man who heard the Son of God and heard his voice and believed, he was transferred to this domain of life. And so the Lord summarizes that in verse 25. When you hear the voice of the Son of God, you obey, you believe, then you pass over into life. That is now, from death to life. Verse 26, For even as the Father has life in himself, so he has given to the Son also to have life in himself. So there you see again this uh, wonderful uh, unity. Unity in power to give life. And so this is another example of this wonderful unity between the Father and the Son. And then he speaks about an important point, verse 27, and has given him authority to execute judgment. That is coming. Now the time of grace. But judgment is coming. And God has given that judgment into the hands of the Son of God. Yes. What does it say in verse 27? Because he is Son of Man. God is going to judge the whole universe through a man, the Son of Man. The great judgment seat, the white throne judgment in Revelation 20. There will be a man seated on the throne. And before his face, heaven and earth flee away. And when the dead will be raised to be judged, and before the judgment seat, they cannot say, God, your standards are too high. You, you are God and I'm just a man. God will say, look, who is there seated on the throne? The Son of Man. 
You could have lived like him. You didn't. You're condemned. So this is the Son of Man. In Acts 17, Paul brings out the same um, conclusion. At the end of his message to the philosophers, in essence, he said that God has given proof that he's going to judge the whole universe through a man and giving evidence of this by raising him from among the dead. And so the Lord as a man, as the risen man, is going to be the judge. In verse 28, Wonder not at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice. That is an other hearing of the voice. And shall go forth. That is the believers who have passed away. They will hear his voice a second time. They have heard his voice in grace. They responded to this call in verse 25. When the dead shall hear the voice that is the morally dead, hear the voice, and they respond to that. That is when you believed. But the believers who have passed away, they will hear that voice a second time, and then will go from the tomb. And beloved, we will hear that voice a second time also, when the Lord will come with the shout of the archangel, with the voice of God, as you read in 1 Thessalonians 4, then we will hear that voice again, but it's only believers who will hear that voice. So you have to be a believer in order to hear this voice and to go forth to him, out of the tombs or to meet him in the air. And verse 29, those that have practiced good, here it is connected with our responsibility. God does not put that aside. The believers are marked by the fact that they are practicing good. It's not to try to improve yourself. The believers are now marked by acting good. Loving the brethren, as we saw in 1 John 3. That is practicing good. And so they, as believers, not because of their good works, but as believers, they are then introduced to resurrection of life. Their bodies will be introduced into this sphere. Spiritually, we have been introduced already into that sphere. But then also our bodies will be transformed and introduced into that sphere of resurrection. But... A thousand years later, you have those who have done evil. They will be raised to the resurrection of judgment. So that is a very solemn uh, distinction. And here in one verse, you have a, a lapse of time of a thousand years, a bit more than a thousand years. So you have to read very carefully the scriptures and also compare with other scriptures in order to understand this. And then in verse 30 the Lord says, I cannot do anything of myself. So there you have again an important statement where he puts himself on the same level as the Father. As I hear I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my will but the will of him that has sent me. So here we see again this unity in will that we saw earlier and then that is concluded by the unity in testimony verse 31 I if I bear witness concerning myself my witness is not true Um, verse 32 it is another who bears witness concerning me and I know that the witness which he bears concerning me is true so the Lord is able to bear witness but he relies on the witness of the Father. And so here we see the unity in witness. The Lord is the faithful and true witness, but he does not uh, present himself as a witness, although he is a witness, but he relies on the witness of others. Now we see that in the conclusion of this chapter, very briefly, just a summary. First, the Lord refers to John as a witness. He has borne witness to the truth. The Lord presented the Messiah to the people. He brought witness to the truth. Now why does the Lord refer to John the Baptist? Because God had sent John the Baptist, and if they would have believed the message of John the Baptist, they would then be brought to the Messiah, would accept the Messiah and be saved. But they did not accept the witness of John the Baptist. Although he was a burning and shining lamp, verse 35, although they were willing for a season to rejoice in his light, but then afterwards they rejected John's message. When it was clear that he introduced the Messiah, uh, they rejected his message. They were not they did not want to be baptized by John. We see that in Matthew 3 and so John um, uh, exposes them. Others were baptized, they believed, but the Pharisees they did not believe. 
But God had sent them uh, to them this witness so that they might believe, but they did not believe. Then the Lord refers to a second witness in verse 36. I have the witness that is greater than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me, that I should complete them. The works themselves which I do bear witness concerning me that the Father has sent me. So this now shows the whole setting. We saw this miracle. And this miracle was an authentication. The Father authenticated the mission of the Son by this miracle. The Father showed that this, through this work... He had really given a valid witness. And so God confirmed the action by his witness. I repeat verse 36, the second part, for the works which the Father has given me. So the Lord did the work, but the Father gave the work. So again, this unity in works. And those works then were a testimony. They authenticated what the Lord had said. They authenticated his mission that the Father had sent me. Then there is a third testimony in verse 37. The Father himself gave testimony. He sent me and he has borne witness concerning me. So here we have the testimony of the Father. When the heavens were opened in Matthew 3 and later in Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration. And so we have the testimony, the witness of the Father concerning the Lord Jesus. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor have seen his shape, and ye have not his word abiding in you. That was said. They did not respond to the witness of the Father. For whom he has sent him, ye did not believe, or you do not believe. So that is the solemn condition in which they found themselves. And then there is a fourth witness, and that is the scriptures. The Lord says, ye search the scriptures. You can also read it as a command, search the scriptures. And they were searching the scriptures. They knew the scriptures inside out. For you think that in them you have eternal life. And of course that in itself was true. But they witness. They bear witness concerning me. And they did not accept the person to whom the scriptures bear witness. So the scriptures were of null and void for these rulers and we saw that earlier they reinterpreted the scriptures according to their own views and so the scriptures show very clearly this is the Messiah but they didn't want to accept the testimony of the scriptures and then there was one more testimony and that's connected with Moses so the scriptures are connected with Moses and at the end of the chapter you see that in verse 46 that Moses will condemn you. Now why is this? See, it's very solemn. The Lord says in verse 40, Ye will not come to me that you might believe. Is there anybody here to whom that applies? You will not come to the Lord because you don't want to believe. And then you cannot receive life. We have seen earlier, hear and believe. Then you receive eternal life. Very solemn. But they didn't want to. And then he says in verse 41, I do not receive glory from man, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. They were looking after the glory of man. The Lord was not looking for glory of man, and they had not the love of God in them. That goes together. When there is not love for God, there is no love for the neighbor. Verse 43, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. What is the consequence? If another come in his own name, ye will receive him. And the world is ready for that. Because they have hardened themselves. They have rejected the gift of the Father. So they will follow whatever else it is. Because they have rejected the truth. That is so solemn. Verse 44. How can you believe who receive glory one from of another and seek not the glory which comes from God alone? This exposes their condition. And beloved, that can happen to us also. Even as believers, we can be marked by a condition like this. Not that we lose our salvation, but we can be marked by a condition like this. Seek the honor of man and not the honor of God. And now the conclusion is, Moses spoke of the Lord Jesus in the scriptures. You can read in Deuteronomy 18 that there would be a prophet like Moses. And Moses said, you should believe him. And so... They trusted, they had put the trust in Moses, but they did not believe the one of whom Moses wrote, verse 46. If you had believed Moses, 
you would have believed me. In a sense, they accepted Moses, but they did not really believe Moses because they reinterpreted his his words, and so they did not believe that the one that Moses predicted had come. And so the Lord says, He wrote of me. By the way, here you see that the Lord Jesus puts the right things of Moses, inspired scripture, even above his own spoken words. And then verse 47 is the conclusion, but if you do not believe his writings, how shall you believe my words? There is my point. The writings are put even by the Lord above his own spoken words. This was very solemn. They rejected the written word. Although in appearance, the appearance they give the appearance, they are very uh, zealous, very religious. They want to keep the word. But with all their zeal and all their religiousness, they did not believe the scriptures. They did not keep the scriptures. And so they rejected the one of whom Moses had written. How solemn this is. So we conclude with this. This is a wonderful chapter that shows the greatness of the Son of God, who is also the Son of Man. And um, as the Lord leads, another time we may see more of His greatness, also in connection with the Son of Man in chapter 6. But we have to see this, keep this in mind. The greatness of the Son is revealed here so that we would receive life, so that we would believe. And the moment we have believed, that is the evidence of a work of God in us. The two go together as I said earlier. But this is a wonderful chapter and that I wanted to see it in its totality. There are many details that we could elaborate much more. And if there is a question, uh, perhaps we can have a few moments uh, for that. And then we can conclude in a uh, hymn and a prayer, perhaps. It's not a question, but while you're going through the latter part of that kind of chapter, the verse that came to me was, Peter and his defense on the day of Pentecost. And when you say, you men of Israel, you do as it were. Hear these things. Jesus of another are not approved of God. But he's, yeah. yeah. By miracles and wonders and signs. Yeah. With God, with God, yeah. and mystery. Yeah. That is a very good point because that confirms exactly what I tried to explain here, that the works confirmed who he was. And these works were given by the Father and by God, he was approved by God. God showed, this is my man, through those miracles that God gave him to do. And so we better take heed and take in these miracles and um, by faith of course, but see then how God authenticated his mission by these miracles. Other points? Just what I put down. It is said that the end of verse 3 and the entire verse 4, not in the early, early manuscripts of God. This is a technical question. It's a valid question, of course, but I, I didn't elaborate on that because it is not really edifying. Whether it is in the text or not, this was a fact. So, uh, when we include it in the text, it refers to a fact that showed something of God's mercy for his people. If it was not in the text, at least we have later on a reference a little bit further. The man himself refers to that, and that is in the text, when, we, when he says, I have no man. See, and then he refers to the uh, stirring of the water in verse 7, and that is in the text. So, whether this was added later to explain the situation, some believe that, but it's not really that important. But it's, of course, a valid question to consider. But some would therefore take something like this and to doubt the authenticity of the scriptures, and that's, of course, always wrong. Any other question or point? Just one question. In verse 25, verse 29. The question is that in verse 25, Christ seen as the Son of God, and in, in, in verse uh, 27, he's seen as the Son of Man in regards to the resurrection. So in verse 25, it is the first resurrection. In verse 29, it is the second resurrection. Yes, that's a good observation. So for 25, but the scripture doesn't call that his first resurrection. The scripture um, is, uh, connects that with the quickening. When we have heard his voice, 
we have been introduced into life, we receive eternal life the moment we hear His voice. That's why I say this is now, this is the moral truth. Whereas in connection with resurrection, verse 28, when we hear His voice, that is in connection with physical resurrection. So there's a parallel and there's a difference, distinction. Yes. refers also to the people and so far they really uh, followed that kind of leadership. So in some cases the emphasis on the religious leaders, in some cases it represents the nation as such because the nation was identifying themselves with their leaders. They were therefore also responsible for having rejected the Messiah. But uh, you're right, sometimes the emphasis is on the leaders when it's called the Jews, sometimes uh, a wider uh, sphere. Yeah. So we have to read carefully, but it's too bad that the people who initially saw the miracles, the Messiah, he must be the Messiah, they were then swayed by the leadership to follow them. And that's even today. I read the report, there was a, um, a Jewish believer in Jerusalem, he always reaches out to um, Orthodox Jews, and they had a conversation with him, and they read Isaiah 53, and they were very amazed. And then the end of the story was, well, we'll ask our rabbi. So that is the same problem. Yes? In this chapter we have the man referred to a certain man. In the Acts of the Apostle, we have chapter 3, the man at the temple. He's also referred to as a certain man. I think so. A certain man. I pull the facts there. And uh, whereas we look at John chapter 9 and we see a man who is blind, but he referred to as a man of blind. Why is the scripture referred to as a certain man? Yeah. yeah, well, a certain man is really representative of the whole. But I try to explain. This certain man represents the whole nation, especially the leadership. And that's also in Acts chapter 3. When um, the, in the other uh, example, uh, he also, I believe, represents the whole nation, but there's more the emphasis on that person, because then a time had come that the nation had completely rejected the offer that the God gave through the Messiah, but I don't know if that is really the reason. I, I would, would have to look into that further. Sorry, but I cannot make a definite statement about that. So we conclude with this. Thank you for your attention and may the Lord bless his word.